And I want to start off by calling out that word psychedelic. So that word came into our vocabulary in 1956. A person named Humphrey Osmond, who actually originated from the west of Europe, or I guess now Britain, and found himself in Saskatchewan, Canada, very quiet, rural part of the country. He coined that phrase, psychedelic. In psychedelic, at the time, meant mind manifesting, to be able to manifest with the assistance of a substance that which is not readily available. It was associated with an alteration in consciousness and a profound non-ordinary experience. Now, psychedelic, for many, many decades, referred to serotonergic psychedelics. And the serotonergic psychedelics have three different categories. The first category, best known as the tryptamines, is represented by psilocybin in its active moiety psilocin. Or we have 5-methoxytryptamine or tryptamine. Another category of the serotonergic psychedelics is what's called the ergolines, which is LSD. And a third category, category is called the dimethylalkylamines, which is known as mescaline. So we have different categories within this broad tent called serotonergic psychedelics. But what's happened in the last couple of decades is this moniker called psychedelics been expanded. And in addition to the serotonergic psychedelics, such as psilocybin or LSD, we also have what's called the intactogens or the empathogens, best represented by MDMA, methylene dioxymethamphetamine. And MDMA is an old drug, we'll come back to the history of this a bit later, is also in this category. And then the third category is called the dissociatives, the NMDA antagonists. These are agents like ketamine, S-ketamine, dextromethorphan, which is the active moiety in ovality. Also, people are looking at nitrous oxide as a, another NMDA antagonist to treat depression. So we have three categories. Psychedelics is the serotonergic psychedelics. We have the intactogens like MDMA, and we have the dissociatives such as ketamine, S-ketamine. So I start off with that because already psychedelic is a big, big zip code. It's a big zip code. And these are mechanistically very different treatments. And when we're talking about psychedelic assisted psychotherapy today, PAP, we're talking about serotonergic psychedelics and MDMA. I have a few comments on CAP, ketamine assisted psychotherapy a bit later on. Now the gist of this is, the concept of this is, and this is not new, this goes back to the 1950s and even earlier, frankly, where we as persons have psychological and emotional material. And that psychological and emotional material is accessed easier by administering a exogenous substance, in this case a serotonergic psychedelic or MDMA. And in the case of taking the substance, the person with the lived experience can now access that material. And through the psychotherapy, the psychotherapy gives us an opportunity to re-edit the experience and then to reconsolidate the experience. In the case of MDMA, the theory has been that when you take MDMA, not only are you able to retrieve this material, but you're able to retrieve it in a way that it's there, but you're not having the profound emotional reaction to it. You're almost on the outside looking at it as a third person. And the idea is, is that through editing and through working it through, that then reframes it and it can be then reconsolidated. And the notion of psychedelic assisted psychotherapy contains many assumptions. It contains the assumption that you need psychotherapy 
for psychedelics to work. It contains the assumption that the psychedelic is facilitating access to the deep crevices of your mind and that this process is taking place. It's also, in fact, speaking to something else, and that is, is that the psychedelic experience is requisite for this all to work. So there's a host of assumptions here. And these are assumptions that are still being tested. They're hypotheses that are being tested. And what we're struggling with is not whether persons need support. Everyone needs support when they take one of these treatments. We all agree on that. And we all agree people could benefit from psychoeducation taking these treatments. But the critical question is, does the protocolized psychotherapy, is it the active ingredient that's being facilitated by the psychedelic? Is it the other way around? Is really the therapy just facilitating the action of the drug? And this is something we are still debating. Now some might say, well, this is clearly evidence you're an academic because you got way too much time on your hands, obviously. That's what academics have is too much time on there. Who really cares? Well, this is conceptually important, but that's more for the classroom. But it has huge implications for the discovery and development and implementation of these interventions. It also has huge implications for cost, for access, for reimbursement, for scale. Now, the the Department of Health and Human Services has already come out a year and a half ago and stated, across America, we are short at least two to three million therapists right now. So therapists are not in, you know, in, in, we don't have a surplus of therapists. So we have to get this right. And so I wanted to lay the groundwork for this just to get us thinking. And again, what most of us agree is that you have to have support and you have to have psychoeducation. The real question is whether or not the protocolized psychotherapy is critical. And I would put forward this is still a testable hypothesis. Now that's not to confuse matters. We know in major depressive disorder, if you have treatment resistant depression and you take a medication and at some point you're also receiving cognitive behavioral therapy, your outcomes are better than the medication alone. But this is a different paradigm. This is a paradigm wherein the integration of the experience, the integration of the material facilitated by the drug is part of the whole delivery method. It's, 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 it's something we're still struggling with.